Hello. Hello, everybody. I'm going to say a few things, or perhaps more than a few things, about an exhi exhibit that Lucy Gatchell and I have um, mounted in the Cook Library in Tamworth. And uh, we're zooming it. I wish I could be live, but there we are. Such is life. Rewilding our vocabulary. The Scottish poet Norman Mackay wrote, Where are your dictionaries of the winds, of the grasses? Well, you know how it is when you're captured by something you read. You turn off your usual path and you're impelled to explore, drawn in by these new thoughts. I, a while ago, opened the pages of Landmarks by Robert McFarlane. It had a profound effect on me. See, books like landscapes leave their marks on us, in us. Sometimes these are so faint as to be imperceptible, tiny shifts in the weather of the spirit that don't register on the usual instruments. Mostly these marks are temporary. We close the book and for the next hour or two the world seems oddly brighter at its edges. Certain books, though, like certain landscapes, stay with us, even after we've left them, changing not just our weathers but our climates, leaving our attentions refocused. In this book, Landmarks, I read that some years ago the Oxford Junior Dictionary took out some words, exited, cancelled them. These words, well, for me, and I'm sure for many of us, these words are jewels in the treasury of our natural world. Acorn, almond, ash, beech, blackberry, bluebell, buttercup, dandelion. Dandelion taken out? Imagine these words not there anymore. And listen to the poetry of them. Fern, hamster, heron, herring, holly, ivy, kingfisher, lark, lobster, minnow, otter, ox, oyster, pasture, raven and willow. These words and more have been replaced by blog, broadband, bullet point, chat room and voice mail, among other familiar designations of digital life. Necessary, I'm sure, but instead of the other words... <sighs> I look at my granddaughter at four years old and I know, I know for absolutely sure that she must not lead an exclusively digital life, a vicariously lived life. No, she must continue as she does now to draw pictures in the sand with a stick, to lie on the cool evening grass and watch the moon rise to wonder at the imprints of her bare feet on the wet shore sand at the sea, listen to the whirring of a dragonfly's wings. Now the loss of words is a very serious matter and there are many that have been lost over the years, unremembered, abandoned. There's a quote from Wendell, Wendell Berry who connects language and successful conservation. He writes, Def people defend what they love and to defend what we love, we need a particularizing language for we love what we particularly know. Hmm. I was brought up in Scotland, two miles down a dirt track from the main road, a childhood rich in wildness of a kind I discovered more recently that some of my ancestors came from the Isle of Lewis, an island in the Outer Hebrides off the west coast of Scotland. We visited it some years ago. The day was stormy, windswept, rain sleeted, with rare sun, cold Atlantic waters thrashing the cliffs. Many tourists are a, a little challenged. <laughs> it was glorious. Our son Tom hiked for miles, alone, solitary, wet. A few years ago, on the Isle of Lewis, 
a company proposed a large development that would cover the island's interior, change its moors forever. The company, in choosing Lewis for its operations, described the moorland of Lewis as a vast dead place. A moorland, a wasteland, worthless, terra nullius, a land of nothing. What to do? A small group of local people against a corporation? How would it be possible to involve people living in Lewis and many beyond in the fight to preserve these moors? How to alter people's perceptions of the moors as a terra nullius to a beloved place, a place that its inhabitants would in a sense re-inhabit? Well here's what happened. A small group of people looked to the power of vocabulary of words, paintings, drawings, poetry, memories, stories. The power to shape sense of place. To invite intimacy with the Moors. They began to create this vocabulary but found to their amazement and delight the legacy of their ancestors. They discovered that much of this vocabulary existed already created and lived for hundreds of years by people living on the Isle of Lewis. A rich and profound vocabulary that goes way beyond words, but does need them. Deepens and elaborates the meaning of the word vocabulary that elegantly, minutely focuses attention. It excites a dynamic, passionate relationship between people and the earth. Well, they won that battle, reported as a conspicuous and optimistic victory. And the Moors live in their mists still and still and still. Since then, many lost words have been found in stories, songs carved into stone, and I want to read you a few of the ones that were rediscovered. I hope they'll speak for themselves by singing to you about the most exquisite of details in this precious planet we live in and must protect. Robert McFarlane writes, we need to rewild our vocabulary. I see vocabulary as going beyond words into seeing, scenting, touching, celebrating the visions these words open in the mind and their tastes on the tongue. So as I read them, you, you might want to look at my lovely face, but you might also just gaze outside the window or close your eyes and allow your imagination to work its magical powers. The Northamptonshire, Northamptonshire, that's a part of England, the Northamptonshire dialect verb to crizzle, for instance, a verb for the freezing of water that evokes the sound of a natural activity too slow for human hearing to detect. John Clare in 1821 wrote, and the white frost gins crizzle pond and brook. When Gerard Manny Hopkins didn't have a word for a natural phenomenon, he would simply wonderfully make one up. Shive light for the lances of sunshine that pierce the canopy of a wood, or gold foil for a sky lit by lightning in zigzag dints and creasings. And Hopkins, like Claire, Claire sought to forge a language that would kind of register the participatory dramas of our relations with nature and landscape dramas. So, eyes still closed if you wish. A Cauchen, and I, I don't speak Gaelic, so forgive me if my accent is not perfect. A Cauchen, but I love these words, they, they get you in the base of the throat, Cauchen. That's a slender moor stream obscured by vegetation, such that it is virtually hidden from sight. A fjarden is a small stream running from a moorland loch. 
and a faith is a fine vein-like watercourse running through peat, often dry in the summer. And then just listen to the visual poetry of this. Rio nach mayum. That means the shadows cast on the moorlands by clouds moving across the sky on a bright and windy day. And eight, the practice of placing quartz stones in streams so that they sparkle in moonlight and thereby attract salmon to them in the late summer and autumn. And then there's Tian Bioroch, the flame or will o' the wisp that runs on top of heather when the moor burns during the summer. And one of my favourites, Amil, a Devon term for the thin film of ice that lacquers all leaves, twigs and grass blades when a freeze follows a partial thaw. I've begun to pen words, as I hope some of you might be inspired to, that now come to me as I wander this exhibit and its artworks, but as I wander our local landscape here. And I just want to read just a few that I've written in the hopes that you too might be inspired. Long ago tellings. Aging stone walls glimpsed through the forest floor, telling stories of hope and striving. Water skin music, the musical script writ on the water's surface as the wind conducts its orchestra. Caterpillar camouflage, and this was particularly inspired by some of Lucy Gatchell's photographs. Caterpillar camouflage, the symphony of startling gems that we rarely notice. And enthusiasm as in robins, when they gather busily and eagerly on the ground after snow melt. Dappled dance, the dappling of light danced by sun and shadow in the forest. Just walk there in your imaginations and you'll see it. Water intricacy, a cobweb traceried at the water's edge. I looked through one at the edge of Chikoroa Lake recently I looked through it and I saw the world through a different lens. Marsh murmurings, the moments of theatre. If you stand quite still near wetland and allow the curtains of your senses to open. Wing whispering, flight songs sung by the wings of birds and insects. And a couple more. Dragonfly delicacy. Again, this was Lucy's inspiration. The magic of kaleidoscope in a dragonfly's wing. And this was Catherine Fields, actually. Trees translating the poetry of the trees. Words, elegant, precise, witness to glorious detail, words that fight for conservation. I urge you to walk, pen, paint, imagine and protect. This exhibition displays art and words on this theme and we hope it contributes to an artistic and lyrical community vocabulary because the exhibit is in a sense a storytelling. And narrative do shape our sense of landscape, our inner and outer landscape. And I've always thought of ingredients of narratives being word, but no, not just words. Stories are also told in musical notes, the performance of a paintbrush, the calligraphy of scissors. So if you can come into the exhibit, which I hope some of you can and have, I suggest you stand by Jim Diamond's extraordinary photographs taken just a short distance away from here and one with the moon made me remember the glorious lines of a poem slowly silently now the moon walks the night in a silver shoe and then Karen Hutchinson's took me to the seashore in the beginnings of the evenings and I could hear the music in its place of light.
and I walked high into the distances of a great ridge in a painting by Catherine Field, and I could actually viscerally feel my perspectives shifting. And then she took me to water, Catherine Field did, in another, where the water sang its poetry to me. Lucy Gatchell took me into a precision of the exquisite with her photographs, took me to secret gems we hardly know of until she gives us glimpses of them. Tom Posner, ah, what a symphony of shadows. And in the exhibit, we invite you to look up where more words live and wherein flies the mighty albatross soaring, seeing, created by Will Cabell for one of our children's theatre performances years ago. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swound. At length did cross an albatross through the fog it came. The rhyme of the ancient mariner tells a powerful story. And stories are a vital part of this dynamic relationship we need to have with our natural world. And I'll close with a word and a story, a short story. It's a vital word, it's a dancing world, it's called word, it's called empathy. And I hope that rewilding our vocabulary will help us find empathy with our natural world at many, many, many levels. And my short story is that years ago I went to Kinlochleven in Scotland and I walked, I struggled, climbed in the glory of a mountainside. And it was so tiring you could barely look up until you got to the top and looked at the world. And then I noticed down below were something that didn't look like the normal little cottages. It looked, could it be a factory of some kind? What was this? And what was it in this landscape I'd walked up that wasn't quite right? And I discovered afterwards that it was a place where they created aluminium, what you, you call aluminium. And it was last night that I was making supper and I pulled out the aluminum and I thought, no, Marion, you do not have to use this. Close your eyes and think of Kinloch Leven. Feel the skin of its landscape being disturbed, interfered with, and you can find an alternative to aluminum. So, thank you, everybody. And I hope those of you who can, can come to the exhibition um, and it's been great to talk to you. <laughs> bye bye. And yet, don't go. Goodbye? I don't think that's a word that should be part of our lyrical vocabulary. I don't think we can say goodbye to what I've been talking about. And again, as I glance around the exhibit, I see Miles Grinstead's tree that she made out of wood with a saw that evokes the trees on the Irish landscape that are so part of the enchantment of the mythology there. And the leaves that pirouette and skit down Jay Rancourt's incredible waters of her silk paintings and the image of the oak that Tony Flood's stained glass holds in its magnificence. Let's stay with it and not bid it farewell.